Hey everyone, welcome to your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. I'm Beth McCord and my psychic, Jeff McCord, will join us on another episode because today we are going to be doing a typing session. So we know a lot of you are interested in using the Enneagram with other people. And I hope you know that you can't tell someone their type. All we can do is to guide and help others to discover their type. The reason is we don't know their core motivations. We don't know why they do what they do. We just see the outward behavior or language they use. And yeah, we can make some guesses, but that's just all we can do. So if someone wants to find their main type, we train people to become certified Enneagram coaches and help them to know how to help guide someone to discover their main type. And so today we're going to be joined with a guest who's kind of looked into the Enneagram, kind of interested in knowing his type, but also a little skeptical, maybe a little suspicious of the Enneagram. And that is exactly who we want here for you guys just to kind of see what is it like to take someone in a discovering process to finding their main type. Um, And so uh, John Stom is going to join us. He is great friends with our podcast producer, Jeff McCullough, and we're just thrilled to have him here. So what we've done is, and how I set up my typing sessions is I have them take our yourenneagramcoach.com free assessment. And all you guys got to do is just go to our website in the upper right hand corner is the free assessment. Anyone can take that. But what you need to know is all assessments are only as good as the person knows themselves because we're really just reflecting back to them the answers that they've submitted. Now, when they get their answers, it is a guiding post, helping them to see what is probably their main type, but also we give all the results of all nine types in a percentage form. Now, what happens in our free assessment is that you'll take a majority of the questions, and then at the last five questions, we have you decide between two of your top two numbers. So we really try to make sure, okay, well, Here's your top two numbers. Which one do you really think you are? Now, the person's probably not knowing that's what's happening, but at the end, you'll see some results. And John is actually a perfect example how the main type that came out on the test is actually a lower percentage of the second number. And that's because, remember, at the end of the test, there's those five questions. He actually chose the one that he previously had a lower percentage, but he said, nope, I think this is me. So this is where an Enneagram coach can really step in and help guide a person who's a little confused, not really sure which is their main type. Now he can look through all these numbers and he can assess for himself by reading different things, you know, which one is his main type, but that can be kind of confusing, right? Cause the Enneagram is a very complex system. And so I'm here to walk him through that process. Again, the main thing is I'm here to guide him. I'm not here to tell him his type. Um, I'm here just to re- reflect back to him what I'm hearing and ask curious questions. So let's uh, welcome John. Hey, John, how are you doing? Hey. How's it going? Good, good. So glad to have you here. Yeah, glad to be here. This is awesome. Thank you. So how are you feeling about going through this discovering process? Um, good. I, uh, I, I know probably very little about the Enneagram. Um, my wife seems to know a lot more about it than I do. I don't know. It just kind of came out of nowhere. I, I feel like everyone all of a sudden around me was talking about the Enneagram one day and like they all knew their types. And I was yes. like, what is this? What is this thing? And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know a whole lot. I, I've um, picked up a lot from my friend Jeff, who you mentioned is the uh, producer of this podcast. So I've picked up a lot um, just kind of overhearing um, episodes of the podcast. So, uh, you know, I've got a, a kind of a base level knowledge of maybe maybe a little bit about each number, um, enough where <laughs> – my wife and even some of her friends have tried to like fig- help me figure out what my number is. Um, uh-huh. So I have like some vague ideas, but I was actually pretty surprised by these, these results. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, so your wife, I'm just curious, what, what is her type? She is a two. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, well, that's going to be great. So what I've done is I put together a document really to kind of help this process. I basically taken kind of like cut and paste different things from all the materials we have for our coaches. Um, we have a really big 350 page, uh, coaches certification, uh, 
basically textbook. And so I've kind of pulled different elements from that so that we can kind of look at some of your top four numbers, just because I don't know which of these is your main type. So I thought, well, I'm just going to pull out some information. And then usually what's going to happen is I'll hear things and I'll kind of all start to whittle down. And hopefully we'll just kind of focus on two types. Right now I have four, um, just in case, you know, one of the ones that I think are outliers is like, oh, wait, that actually might be your main type. So it's interesting with John's assessment results is that his results actually do exactly what I'm saying is that his second highest number actually became his top pick at the very end between those uh, top five, uh, two choices. So he has 60% as the type seven and 71% as the type nine. But again, as he picked between those top two numbers, he ended up picking type seven more than type nine. And so it can be a little confusing when you get the results because it's like, this doesn't make any sense. It says 60%, but it's saying that's me. Well, what we're trying to do with our assessment is help you to really pick what you think is your top choice in those last two numbers. But we also want you to do um, your due diligence in reading about the types because when you're trying to find your type or if you're trying to help another person find their type, it's all about why they do what they do. So another thing that I like to do when I'm going to do a typing session is I'll have them go to your Enneagram forward slash core motivations and download that free PDF because that PDF shows all nine types core motivations. And then I have the person rank them from most like me all the way down to least like me one to nine. So you have to put them in order of what your preference is like, yes, this is me. This is kind of me. This is not really me. This is totally not me. Now this can be tricky because it's like, well, I can kind of see myself in several numbers, which is true because we do use all nine types to varying degrees. But by doing this, it helps us to see and compare the results from our YEC free assessment and how they've chosen to rank these in order. So what's interesting here, John, as you can see, is type nine is on both of these, your top choice percentage wise and by, you know, just your ranking. Yeah. Now what's also interesting is though you pick type seven, so seven and nine were your top two choices. And so at the very end, those last five questions, for whatever reason, you resonated more with the wording of type seven versus type nine. And so as a coach, I'm just like curious, you know, like, huh, I wonder what those questions were. Now we could go back and look at them, but I'm not going to do that. But I'm basically going to do is ask you some clarifying questions um, moving forward. But by having you rank the numbers, what's interesting is you chose type seven as your fifth choice the fifth most like you. And so that makes me very curious. Now, as an Enneagram coach, I know that type nines and sevens, they both um, are in the same coping conflict style. Okay. So both of these types are optimist. They, if there's a problem, hey, it's gonna work out fine, don't worry, let's keep going. Yep. Um, they can be both very personable, connecting types. And so as an Enneagram coach, I that's why I, hiring a coach to help people that are a little bit stuck or unsure is really important because we have all this other knowledge kind of in the back of our mind that I'm going, well, I can see how these two types might, or he might think he's a seven, but maybe he's really a nine or maybe he is a seven. Um, so that's why we're going to start to kind of pull these things apart. So what I'm going to do is um, we'll come back to this um, graphic if we need to, but at least you can kind of see down here that three and three are on the top four. One, the other one that's kind of lower is type six is way down here, but type six is way up here. Yeah. Now type sixes and nines actually are the hardest to figure out their types. Nines because mm. they see all, all nine viewpoints. So they're all like, well, I could have picked any of these. That's me. To some degree. I feel, I, yeah, that, that sounds like me. Yeah, yeah. And then the sixes are like, well, it depends. Like, it depends on the situation. Like, and so they're always saying it yep. depends. And yep. when I saw your ranking come through, that kind of was the verbiage you used a little bit. So I'm, mm -hmm. as an Enneagram coach, just to let people out there know what's going on in my mind is I'm like, 
hmm, I'm wondering if nine and six are the ones we're going to be mainly focusing on. Now, I probably wouldn't say that normally in a typing session, but because people are listening to see what this is like, I'm kind of giving some insights. So that's why I put this document together. So we can kind of go back and forth in different ways. So the first thing I want to do is just to really look at types nine and seven. Um, it's important for us to look at the core motivations. Um, because the core motivations are why you think, feel, and behave in particular ways. Because a nine and a seven, in a lot of ways, can look very similar, especially if a nine is an extrovert. So what we want to do is go, okay, but why, let's see, why are you optimistic? Or why are you fun to be around? So what we can see here is the nines are easygoing, pleasant, calm, and always willing to accommodate um, without strong preferences of their own. This hides the fact that they want independence and autonomy not to be bothered so that they can experience inner peace. If life or people interrupt that inner peaceful state, they will try to accommodate to keep the peace so they can quickly go back to that inner calm. They don't often express their desires or feelings because they believe that it will cause conflicts or discord. This causes them to suppress their anger and go along to get along. So that's just kind of a summary. But here's the core reasons, the core motivations of why they do those things. So the nine's core fear is so what they're running away from, trying to prevent uh, from happening. See if this is like you. We fear being, and I say we because I'm a nine, uh, we fear being mm -hmm. in conflict, any kind of tension, any kind of discord, feeling shut out or overlooked, and losing connection with others. But the core desire of the nine is to have inner stability and peace of mind. So that's what we're always striving for. Yeah. Now we have the core weakness of uh, sloth. Now sloth here is not talking about physical laziness, though nines do like their cozy comforts. This is remaining in an un unrealistic and idealistic world to keep the peace, remain easygoing, and not to be disturbed by their anger, falling asleep to their passions, abilities, desires, and needs, and worth by merging with others. So how can I go along to get along? How can I see your point of view? And we can just kind of smoothly go through life. You know, I just want peace. I'll... I'll uh, let go of my preferences, my abilities in order to make you shine, in order to make you happy so that there's peace. That's kind of the mindset. That's the sloth, the not knowing oneself. But the core longing of the nine is your presence matters. So before we kind of talk about, you know, does that resonate with you or not? Let me just jump over here real quick to seven, because I think since those came up as your top two scores, especially you pick seven at the very end is your top, top score. I'm curious to see which one really yeah. resonates with you. And I think once we go there, we can start to um, assess what might be your main type. So for the type sevens, type sevens are joyful, they're enthusiastic, and social people that radiate optimism in all situations. As lover, lovers of variety, they live life big and are eager to enjoy all new experiences that the world has to offer. They see endless possibilities and innovation all around them. Type sevens do not want to be limited, restricted, or bored. They are constantly battling the anxiety that they will never really get what they want and need uh, what they want and need in life and are always feeling a deep emptiness inside. So to distract themselves from these anxieties, they settle for more or any stimulation or experience they can kind of get their hands on. So the core fear of the seven is being deprived trapped in emotional pain, limited, bored, missing out on something fun. So the true FOMOs of the world. So these are the people that are constantly going, bringing in stimulation. Their minds are bristling all the time. Right. They're constantly thinking of the next thing. Actually, they, they think of the next, the next, next thing. And they have options, you know, like 10 options of, well, if I get bored, I could do this, this, and this. Now, their core desire is to be happy, fully satisfied and content, but they struggle with the core weakness of gluttony. Now, gluttony here, yes, it does have to do with food, but it's more than that. They feel that they have a great emptiness inside and having this insatiable desire to fill themselves up with experiences and stimulations and hopes of feeling completely satisfied and content. 
So think of the seven as having an empty bucket inside that has holes at the bottom. And it's kind of like that feeling of starvation, like uh, there's something empty. And so they're constantly grabbing stimulation and fun and joy and adventure and all the things of life that can bring happiness. And they're putting in that bucket and they're like, this is great. This is great. And then they look down like, wait, why is it empty again? Oh my gosh, I've got to go to the next thing and the next thing. And there's that insatiable desire. So all of these experiences life can feel like if they're, they stop for a second and look, it, it's actually more like cotton candy where, yeah, it's sweet to the taste. It's fun but it doesn't last and it doesn't give the nourishment to the hunger pangs that we're desiring. But their core longing right. is to hear and experience you will be taken care of. So just on those two, what resonates, what doesn't, can you see yourself more clearly in one and the other? Yeah, that that's actually really helpful to just walk walk through it and hear you like explain a little more detailed um, because it's, it, it is interesting. <laughs> and I'll, you'll probably hear me say this a, a few times. I feel like I do um, resonate with different parts of each one of them. Um, but seeing them side by side and talking them through both, I, I think I feel a lot more drawn to the nine. Um, there, the, the few parts of the seven that I do what probably, um, I don't remember the questions. Like, like you said, I don't remember the questions in the, in the evaluation, but I probably connected with the optimism in all situations. Um, the variety, like I'm reading that top part of the summary, the variety, um, but not so much the, yeah. the feeling of emptiness um, or wanting to fill up uh, my mm -hmm. life with experiences, like the next experience and the next, um, you know, stimulation. It's not exactly, I don't really resonate totally with that part of it, um, but the um, yeah. mm -hmm. being happy, fully satisfied and content, that, that core desire, um, I think that mm -hmm. really clicks with me. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that part of it. But then the nine, um, a lot of it really it feels like me. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and it depends, I guess it depends on, I almost like, I'm trying to think of all the diff different situations in my life where, you know, I've got my marriage and then I've got my work. Um, I'm, you know, thinking back to all the different ways that I behave. And, and, um, I think definitely in my marriage, I feel like a nine. <laughs> That's not a thing there. You can be a different number. In it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is like, no, that all of this is really helpful. And this is what I want you to know. And as I coach people, say whatever comes to mind or what okay. you're feeling, you might not see the connections, but I'll start hearing and, and piecing things together. And if not, then I'll ask clarifying questions. So feel free to just say okay. whatever. Don't worry if it's the right thing or the wrong thing. Sure. All of it matters. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah, when I, when I was reading the nine, I was like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. I, at home with my wife and just the way that I, I feel like I, um, not that I just like, um, don't care um, but I, I almost just like, I, I, I feel like I default to, you know, well, whatever you, whatever you would like to do, how can I help you get, um, what you need out of this situation yeah. or your preferences, your desires? I feel like that kind of keeping the peace, mm -hmm. um, is my go-to, mm -hmm. um, in, in avoiding, maybe, maybe avoiding conflict is probably yeah. what's going on there. Well, that's really helpful. Yeah. So. And that's why I kind of want to put these side by side because, again, the the nine and the seven have some similarities. Now they're they're not connected by wings, so the numbers um, adjacent to your main types. So they're not connected that way. They're not connected by any of the lines, which we call enneagram paths um, here at your enneagram coach. But there is a, another layer to the enneagram called the tri type, and the tri type basically says that you have three. Um, types that really resonate with you the most. One is your main type and then two sub main types. And this is um, spearheaded and the concept um, brought by Catherine Favre. And basically you have a main type. So if you look at the triads, there's the, um, the head, the heart, and the gut. Um, now, and we're not going to get into the tri types that much, but what I do with the tri types in this scenario okay. is I just let people know that, so nine is in the gut triad seven is in the head triad and then twos threes and fours are in the heart triad so all i'm trying to paint a picture for you is the seven because yeah. it sounds like that's not resonating as your top top one that might be in your tri type so it plays a very significant role okay. in your life it's just not your main type 
Um, and once people realize that um, from a typing interview, they recognize, oh, you mean I don't have to let seven go completely because it's not connected by a wing or the Enneagram path lines. It can feel like to someone, mm -hmm. I have to just let it go completely. You know, Now we use all nine types of varying degrees. And if seven is in your tri-type, which we would have to you know, kind of walk that through down the road, if it is in your tri-type, then it really makes sense um, how seven really plays a part of your life. Um, plus, if seven's in your tri-type, you've got the nine, the seven operating in you, and they're both optimists. So it's almost kind of like yeah. double power <laughs> optimism, you know? And, and so then it's like, wow, I'm like super optimist. Now we would have to look at what might be your tri-type in the heart um, center of the two, three, and four, which we're not going to necessarily go into right now. But both the two and the um, three are kind of on the optimist spectrum, two more than, than three. But either way, they're both like, I mean, you could be a superpower um, <laughs> optimist. Um, and so that could look like a seven um, because sevens are the reframers of the world. They want to bring joy and fun. They don't want to sit in negativity. And so that's why you could easily think you're a seven. But that's why looking at the core motivations is so critical yeah. because you can do similar things. All nine types can do similar things, but they're doing it for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and so i just curious, do you feel comfortable uh, letting seven go and continuing to look at the nine space a little bit more? I think so. Yeah. After looking at it back to back, um, I think there's there's maybe a piece of the seven, like I said, that, that kind of connects. And I think it's the optimistic piece and just feeling happy and, and satisfied is kind of a desire. But yeah. And you're married to it too. And they're also on the optimist spectrum. So you got okay. those, you know, that's another, you know, key person in your life, you know, mm -hmm. and then again, as, if seven's in your tri-type, it just really makes, to me, it makes sense. And that's why, you know, for people that are stuck in finding their type to hire a certified coach really matters because you're not going to know all of these little nuances and stuff. And so, but if right. I can paint this picture more clearly, you get to decide if that's you or not versus me saying, no, that's not you, you know, yeah. like I can't, I don't, I don't know. Right. Right. So well, let's take a, just a quick look, and we're not going to go through the summary necessarily, but let's look at the core motivation of six. And then if we need to, we can kind of come back up here to the summary. But for six, and the reason why I'm doing this is because that also kind of resonates with you. It's your second pick on the ranking, and some of the wording you said kind of has a six-like appearance to it. So um, now the six is their core fear is fear itself, being without support, security, and guidance, being blamed, targeted, alone, or physically abandoned. Now they desire to have security, guidance, and support. And part of the reason why they're looking for that is the core weakness of anxiety. Now, every number can be anxious. And so that's not what we're showing here. Anxiety for the six is that they're scanning the horizon of life and trying to predict and prevent negative outcomes, especially worst case scenarios, remaining in a constant state of apprehension and worry. So for the sixes, really to understand them, you need to see and understand that they have an inner committee inside them. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're kind of going through life and constantly their mind is a flywheel. Constantly their mind is thinking, well, did I think about that? Did I plan for this? Well, what about that thing over there? Well, yeah, I planned for that, but then this could happen and that could happen. And and their mind's just constantly going with um, this inner committee that is chiming in from all different perspectives and it's overwhelming, it's exhausting, and they ultimately don't trust themselves. So they look outside of themselves for a trusted person, maybe a mentor, a teacher, maybe a religion, maybe a belief system of some kind, um, facts, maybe okay. getting gathering books and insights, whatever is going to give them that solid, trusted guidance for them to move forward. Because up until that point, they feel stuck. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is they're very discerning and, and very wise, but again, they don't trust themselves because this inner committee is making it very confusing for them. And so, and so they can also kind of lean more into realistic and others will experiencing them as more pessimistic. Okay. Um, but they'll always say they're realist. I'm married to one, have a son that's one, <laughs> mom that's one, best friends that are one. Most of my team, I think are sixes. And they all will say, no, I'm a realist. But mm -hmm. for us optimists, we don't always 
feel bad. And so, gotcha. but they long to hear. So their core longing is to hear and experience you are safe and secure. So just looking at these two back to back. So those that aren't are listening, you know, to this podcast in your car or in headphones on the YouTube channel, you're going to see this actual document that we're walking through. So if you're interested in kind of seeing what we're actually walking through, you can go to our YouTube channel and see it. Um, but as you can see, um, John, so the nine and the six, now they're connected with a line. So they actually do take on some attributes of one another. Um, so the nine can take attributes. They don't become a six, but they can take on some of the attributes of a six um, when they're stressed um, and when they're doing well. So that's a whole nother thing. And the six as well with the nine. But the main thing is why are you doing it? And so it comes back to these core motivations. So I'm just curious, what lands on you? Uh, which one feels more true to you and why? Yeah, again, I think I, there's pieces of the six that um, feel right, but a lot of it that is not quite jiving with me. Like I don't, and, and again, I don't know if this is like maybe the right way to to look at it, but it feels, um, I, I think I feel more at peace inside than what I'm gathering from a six feels inside. <laughs> I don't really feel anxious. Um, I I mean, you know, like you said, everyone feels anxious at some points, but I don't really feel like this kind of um, kind of underlying continual inner committee of anxiety. Um, I don't really I don't really get that. Um, I, I do kind of click with the desire again, maybe just the desire of like security, um, not so much the guidance or support. I feel um, I guess. And I, what does security mean to you, though? I guess maybe I'm thinking of that in terms of um, like um, comfort. Um, mm -hmm. and so maybe that was kind of, um, you know, maybe that's more connected to something else, but I, I feel like one of my core desires as I try to really think about it is just, um, yeah, pe peacefulness, yeah. um, yeah, like, yeah, no, not, uh, not a, a rocky, uh, you know, water, <laughs> no, no, just sort of like a, um, uh, I don't Yeah. Serene, like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. just, yep. yeah. And I think. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll probably um, do what I can to get that. You know, like whether it's avoiding um, yes. certain situations or whether it's um, just taking my own time to be alone or whatever. But I, I don't. Yeah. So this is what's so fascinating and interesting being an Enneagram coach is because when you what you learn is that each type has. Uh, their own lexicon, their own words that they mm -hmm. like to use, the way that their mind thinks. And the nine is all about comfort. Mm -hmm. And so when you said that, so that's why I asked you, well, what does security mean to you? Because obviously everyone wants security, right? right? right. Like we don't want to not be secure, but the security you're looking for is comfort, ease, a uh, serene lake where there's no choppy waters. Like we're all like just you know, happy and getting along and yep. uh, enjoying one another at a, probably at a steady pace. Would that be true? Yeah. 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 Not frenetic, not constantly going and, um, you know, it doesn't have to be frenetic and overly excited or overly worrying mm -hmm. or, and a lot of times nines, we don't even want our minds to be bristling too fast. We don't want high highs and low lows. Now we, we'd rather have highs than lows, right? Right. but we feel most comfortable in this kind of middle ground. Um, yes. And we don't want our minds to be going too fast. Now we do love when, when we do get passionate about something or excited about something, we totally love going. And, and in fact, nines can be some of the busiest on the Enneagram. So that's why sloth is like, hey, it's not necessarily that we're doing nothing. We can actually be super busy and we can be super passionate when we do find what we love. It just takes a long time because the nines have this internal fog. And that fog has been built up over years because as a child, we thought, um, don't, I can't assert myself. If I assert myself, if I assert my voice and my passions and desires, it disrupts the peace. Someone gets upset or they don't really want to do it or they overlook me and I just need to remain quiet and steady. And so the nine usually takes on the passions and the desires of others. They're very moldable and flexible 
And people yeah. love that, you know? They're like, yay, this person's focusing on me and I get yeah. to do what I want, you know? And we're like, sure, yeah, you know? So we have that ability. The problem with it is, is we learn to ignore ourselves. We learn to not get to know our passions and desires. So when someone says, hey, Nine, what do you, what do you wanna do the next five years? It's like, <gasps> don't ask me that question. Does that feel the same for you? Yeah, it's funny because I, I um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I can resonate with that, but I also maybe it's okay. Maybe it's like a I'm I'm future planning for the comfort. Does that make yes. sense? Like I'm, I do think about the yes. future a lot, and I kind of prepare Absolutely. myself in a lot of ways. Like I, I'm pretty organized with um, you know like our home finances and like trying to figure out like okay if I save this much, then that'll prepare me for that. Um, but not in a yeah. not in an anxious way. Not like I'm gonna run out of money if I don't start saving now. Or like it's more just like a I can. I can um, set myself up for future mm -hmm. peace, future comfort. Yeah. Um, if I if I think about and kind of be organized and plan for tomorrow. Exactly, and that's a perfect example of when people say or they'll say, "Oh, but I'm I'm, you know, always planning, you know, ahead." Well, if if the coach doesn't ask clarifying questions and go deeper, or if people just hear them, they're like, "Oh, well." You must be a one because ones are really planners in their right. money. Well, everyone can be a planner in money. Everyone can do the same things, but why? And you're by you revealing, I'm planning so I have comfort. Yeah. I'm planning so I have security, mm -hmm. but it's security in the sense of comfort yeah. that things aren't, you know, like those choppy waters, you know, of a lake, you know, like, hey, I want to plan so that you know, the waters remain steady and we can have a, you know, a great, you know, whether it's, um, you know, in my thirties, my forties, my fifties, you know, I, I kind of can see what's going on. And if I don't plan, I know that that's only going to disrupt my life. Yeah. And that's a that's, very that's healthy. That's totally night. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's funny. I just found this, um, I, I, I save a lot of things, uh, podcast producer Jeff actually makes fun of me because I yeah. save everything. Um, I'm, I'm pretty organized with like my, you know, old photos and old files and everything. And uh, I just found this box um, that has, I guess it's sort of like a, a, a plan I made when I, I was probably, man, I must have been like maybe 12 years old. Um, and I don't know why I kept it because it may, I, I just like, I, I thought it would be interesting for my future self to see, but it was like, this is what I want to do for my career. And I thought, okay, I'll go, I'll do this after college and then I'll, I'll make this much money, um, so that I can save for this much re you know, retirement. I'll have this, I'll have the family and I'll, and it wasn't, and I remember making this thing and not thinking like, this is, a um, like an overachieving kind of like, I'm going to get ahead kind of thought process. It was more like, I, I want to plan so that, yeah. you know, when I'm in my thirties and forties, I don't have these like uncertainties that everything will just be sort of, oh, I figured this out when I was, when I was 12, like it's a good thing I was saving back then. So, yeah. and what's really amazing, I want to share with you something real quick as you say that. Um, so let's go back up to your scores. So three in the Enneagram assessment, our free assessment, you, that was your third highest number. Mm -hmm. And it was the fourth highest number in your ranking, how you ranked the core motivations. The reason why I wanted to bring that up is what you just said there is a very three-like statement. And again, this could make people that are trying to type someone like, oh wait, maybe I'm missing something, versus seeing how this type is a major part of you. Now, again, we're not gonna do a whole try typing session for you, but in the twos, threes, and fours section, it could be that three is also part of your tri-type. And if that's true, it's also a line you're connected to in the Enneagram path. Uh, so nine is connected to three, which means that it's gonna be more potent. You know, it's more concentrated in you. Okay. And most nines, and I have three as well in my tri-type, most nines don't know themselves well enough to articulate what you just said. They are so passive, so go along to get along, that they don't even almost sometimes set up goals. Now, there's lots of uh, nines that do, but if they get too stuck in their nine space, they can actually overlook themselves so much that they don't have a plan. But that three part of you is definitely a planner of where do I want to go? How do I want to get there? So like, here's the end goal. Okay, now I'm going to work backwards and develop a plan or a path yeah. or yeah. Um, yeah. a task to get me there. 
But what's interesting and what I loved what you said is it's so that the three is assisting your nine's core motivations. And that's why it's so important to understand the core motivations because your three part is like, Hey dude, I hear you want comfort. I hear you want peace in your relationships and in your everyday life moving forward. Okay. I'm going to help you to get there. And the way I'm going to help you to get there is to develop yourself. I'm going to help you to get there by setting goals and, um, setting up a path to get there, the tasks that you need to do. Now the nine can, can get overwhelmed by that. If the three tries to overrun the nine in the sense of you must do it like this, yep. you know, and like makes the, the nine frenetic. But the, if the three is healthy within us, the three is like, we can do this. Let's go for it. And, but again, it's all for the core motivations of the nine. That's what you were saying. The yeah. three, on the other hand, if you were a three, it'd be, I have to achieve that because of how that would appear to others. I want to be successful. I want others to think the most highly of me. I want high status and high regard. I want, uh, you know, it's kind of like, I want to shine. Is that how you feel? No, I, yeah, I was going to say I, that, that part of it doesn't rec- uh, resonate with me. So yeah, I, I feel really, um, okay with not being, um, outwardly, you know, um, polished or like uh, uh, having lots of achievements and stuff. So yeah, I think you're right. Uh, or well, obviously <laughs> you know what you're saying. Uh, I agree with you in terms of, um, <laughs> the three part of me that, that I do click with is the, the, um, the, ach- the achiever or like the, um, yeah, the planner, the doer is, is motivated yeah. by, yeah. yeah, that, that nine aspect, which is like, Oh, this will just make things easier for, for me in the future. Yeah. I don't care what other, other people think. I, I, exactly. Because I mean, I think that, that document I was just talking about that I made when I was 12, it wasn't like, you know, be a famous whatever or like be a doctor or something. It was, uh, it was literally very practical. It was like go into the Naval Academy because I wanted to be in the Navy. And then I could, um, there's like a, you know, you could then re- go into the Navy and then you could re- retire at a certain age. And it was just, it was not flashy. It wasn't like about the status. It was just like, I would enjoy this and this would provide a financial future. It was just, yeah. yeah. Well, and so that's what I love is, is about the Enneagram is, you know, and that's why stereotyping or people just reading an overview of the type, they can see themselves often in quite a few numbers. And exactly for the reasons we're saying today, like it could have been a wing. I know one type one is, again, one of your top numbers um, on both of the tests. That may or may not, but it may be the wing that you typically use more than the other. Now we use both wings to varying degrees, though it's always common for nines to put eight near the very last of the list for them. And yet they actually might use eight way more than they realize. It's just that when you ask a nine, um, well, do you, you know, are you basically an eight? The nine is going to be like, no, not at all. But we use that type eight part of our hearts because we really want other people to shine. We care about how other people are seen. Are they heard? Are they, um, are they esteemed, you know, in everyone in an equal degree. And if we see someone marginalized or, or being harmed or bullied or rude, you know, overlooked that eight part of our heart and the nine part of our heart comes together. And it's like, Oh no, I'm, I'm going to stick up for you. Now it's going to be in a very nine ish way, but the eight gives us that strength and that ability to challenge or to move in on the behalf of others, but in a way that's still kind of calm and peaceable, but direct. Does that seem right for you as well? It does. Yeah, it does. So anyway, even though eight is very, very low on your score, I recommend that all nines not shy away from the eight because the eight is such a wonderful asset that we have if we recognize the strengths that the eight brings to us. So what I wanted to show you was the Enneagram paths. Now these are the lines and arrows that were connected to two other numbers. And as type nine, so you as a nine and I as a nine, this is us. Um, And the two numbers we're connected to, which is six and three, play a very big role within us. And a lot of people have been listening to our recent podcast and what will be coming future podcast on a new concept that we've developed called Enneagram Internal Profile, which really talks about how our wings and our two um, 
connecting types, the six and the three for us specifically, play major roles in our life, just like we have been talking today. But if we kind of look at how these um, six and three play in our life in a little bit more of a nuanced way, it's really intriguing. So when a nine is under stress, you're going to take on some of the okay. average, the unhealthy aspects of a type six. And so we'll look here on, so if you guys are on, not on YouTube, hopefully you'll go there and you can see this document up on the screen. But so for the type nine, when you move to six under stress, so remember, we're not doing our best, we're in a really rough space, we can find that our mind is constantly racing, worried, um, and fixated on possible worst case scenarios. We can become irritable, defensive, and frustrated, and we can frantically take care of responsibilities that have been put off for too long. So the nines, you know, for us, um, and again, it has to do with maybe, oh, there might be discord in that relationship. I need to, I need to do this and I need to plan this and like, or I'm going to be late for something. And we start getting a little anxious and frenetic, but it's not our normal self. And so it kind of comes out sideways and it's not really beneficial to us. Um, and we don't like our mind bristling at this fast of a speed, but we're so desperate to get back to that peaceful kind of serene place. We're trying, we're using our mind and kind of our um, irritability to hopefully get us there. Yeah. But unfortunately it just kind of comes out sideways. Do you see this sometimes in your life? Yeah, I I definitely think that um, I can see that coming out. As I, I'm also wondering, because I'm I, I'm trying to picture myself in those situations, and um, I also feel like there's um, sometimes like a paralysis that I feel. Yes. Um, when yeah. I'm under stress, where um, I think maybe like mentally I might be like racing or, or uh, fixating on possible worst case scenarios, but I, I I don't even know that I necessarily act on all that and like um, yes. you know so that race around. A, yeah. That is a great point, and that is the defensive mechanism of the type nine, which is disassociation okay. or narco narcotization. So basically, we numb out, we check out. It's we're too mm -hmm. overwhelmed to even move, to even go. But sixes also can um, feel that way, where they have analysis paralysis. That's mm -hmm. not typically the nines. Um, problem. It's more that our mind is, is we're overwhelmed. And when nines get overwhelmed, we shut down to some degree. It could be Netflix. It could be, I'm just going to go sit on a hammock. It could be whatever. We just yeah. shut the mind down. The sixes can't <laughs> shut their mind down. Yeah. Um, but is that kind of what you're talking about? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel that kind of shut down when things get overwhelming. Yes. Um, and yeah, whether it, it means that I need to sort of keep the peace uh, in a relationship or if it's like, yeah, just need to go check out and like just <laughs> not deal with the problem or something. But yeah. Yeah. And so what's helpful about knowing your Enneagram paths and all of this, so even like your defensive mechanism, it's helpful because you can use it like a rumble strip, like that's on the highway. So when you start veering off course, you're not paying attention or you're falling asleep, that wakes you up. It alerts you like, hey, if you keep going in this direction, it's not going to be beneficial to you. Yeah. And so we can now make that choice of, because normally we just either keep heading in that direction because we fall asleep to ourselves or we just ignore the warning signals. And sometimes we think, no, this is the right way because we've done it our whole life. And then we fall into the same common pitfall and we go, how did I get here again? You know, well, now we can mm -hmm. go, oh, okay, yeah, this isn't beneficial. So if you get irritable or overwhelmed, um, uh, maybe defensive, irritable, all those kinds of things. You can go, huh, I wonder what's going on and be kind to yourself, non-judgmental, and really just try to understand the heart behind it. And then how, what would be a better, a healthier path for you? So that, that is really why we want to know these things. It's not to shame ourselves. It's not to put ourselves down. It's really to help us to stay in a healthy place. Now, the blind spot path, that's the second place that we're going to talk about. Now, this is when you're connected to three. Now, a lot of people don't know what the blind spot path is. Um, they're so used to hearing the stress path and the growth path. But the blind spot path is when we use the type three as a nine in a less healthy way. And the blind spot path really comes out mainly around family and closest friends. 
The reason why I say that is because a lot of the, the things that come out in this blind spot path are the things that we're kind of annoyed about with when we see it in others. And so we don't really want to recognize that we might do it in a different way, but we kind of do it. So the nine moves to the average, the unhealthy parts of three in some of these ways. So demonstrate their value um, and worth by bragging about what they accomplished. Um, they do busy work to feel productive. Uh, uh, productive and distract themselves from in, uh, other important matters. So it's like they feel productive, but they actually have other things they should be doing. But they feel busy. Uh, desire to notice, to be noticed and affirmed. So a lot of times nines overlook themselves and permit and promote others to do it as well. But then that can be really hurtful. And so we we do certain things that try to get the attention like, hey, do I matter at all? And again, we're not even realizing that we're doing it, but our heart really needs to know that we matter and important in some way. And then the last one is um, easily hurt when others point out any flaws or failures. Now, again, this mainly is only happening maybe with your spouse, maybe parents, maybe your closest friends, maybe. Um, and so I know for me as a nine, um, I am never going to go out and be like, hey, look what I've done, you know, like, you know, look at this, you know, um, that just feels like, Ugh, no, but at the same time, because I never do that and I'm never really inviting people to speak into my life in a like affirming positive way, not that people don't, but I'm not inviting that or asking for that. I might at home go, hey, family, like, look what happened or look what I did. And not that that's wrong or bad, but it's that I'm not actually saying what I need. And part of what I need is to let people know in my family and other places, I really could use some affirmation encouragement because sometimes it's hard for me to see it as a nine. I have this internal fog and I also don't think much of myself. And it really helps me when I have that affirmation and that clarity that what I've done has benefited the world or benefited you. And so that would be a healthier way of asking for that versus kind of a sideways, um, you know, trying to garner all this attention and stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now the last two boxes that we see here are the really healthy paths that a nine can take towards three and six. So the first one is the growth path. And that is when you're really starting to grow and to trust and believe that you matter and that your voice matters, then you're going to start to take on some of the average or some of the healthy aspects of the type three. Now that you don't become a three, but you pull in some of those healthy aspects where you're going to take time to discover your desires and passions, invest in yourself uh, through self-development and accomplish new goals. Then you're going to confidently show up in life, assert yourself and bless others with your full presence. You're going to speak more, share more of your knowledge and your insights. And again, it's not from a place of, because this is a healthy place. It's not a place of bragging and showing off. It is a a knowing, a confidence that God has given me these things that I can then bless the world with. Or the other, the other way that nines do it is we hoard. You know, we don't want to hoard our gifts. I mean, the nines, the opposite, like our true desire is to bless others, but we fear so much of being seen as arrogant that we hold on to our gifts. And we're, we're like, oh, I don't really matter. Other people can do this. But this space, when you bring the three part of your heart in a healthy way, the three can say, no, let's show up, let's develop ourselves, and let's bless others with what we have. Yeah. Now, tell me, when has that happened in your life? Yeah, I, I see this play out in a couple of different ways. Sometimes um, at church and in various ministries that I've been a part of, um, mm -hmm. leading a community group with my wife, um, you know, com that, that piece you, you mentioned of showing up and um, desiring to be fully present. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> One nine to another nine. Because this is really hard for the nine to actually say, yeah, this is where I've shown up and done really well. Yeah. Like, like you're even yeah. like, God, it's, it's like the nine. It's yeah, hard. It's, like, it's almost like something is restric restricting us right at the neck level. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and this is exactly the, the beautiful kind of like path that a nine has to get through is that by saying what God has done in and through you to bless others is not bragging. It's not arrogant, though it, feels like yeah. it. we've we've believed this our whole life it's just naming what's true yeah. so i i just would love to hear because i i don't know a, 
a ton about the story between the three of you guys that do the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. but it's really taken off. Like, just tell me some of the, tell me some of the people that you guys are serving, like some of the, you know, the big names. Yeah. So, um, Jeff, the producer of the podcast and, um, and then our other friend, Danny, who all three of us kind of grew up together. Um, we've been, um, we've been making, creating things for a very long time. Uh, we, we started making music together when, when I was in high school and, um, and that was just a very, you know, it's just the creative outlets, I think that we need, they always, they find a way to express themselves. The, the three of us, we're always yeah. doing something. So whether it was making music together or now making videos together, um, yeah, we run this company now where we make commercials. So, um, you know, they're, they're, um, we specialize in making, um, like toy commercials. So, um, you yeah. know, you get to see mm -hmm. the kids. You mentioned like, who, who are you serving? Who, uh, and I, I immediately thought of the kids that we get to see kind of light up yeah. from, um, playing with these toys or getting excited about the possible, you know, new Christmas gift or something. And so, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And where can they find, like, if, if people were like, I'm so curious, like what, what are these, you know, where are the videos, where can they go? They can uh, go to our YouTube channel, which is called Randomonium. Uh, Randomonium. You search Randomonium on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So, well, and we'll have it in the show notes as well. So people can go there, but I just want people to go there because, you know, John, you're such a great representation of the nine who's, it's so hard to say, what you do well and how you serve others because of that that really deep fear of being seen as arrogant and prideful and you know yeah. all of the things that come with that um but that's where we get to learn no i can actually say what i do well because it directly comes from god and i wouldn't be able to do it well without him um, but it takes a lot of time and even when i do it it's still never easy but i recognize the benefit that it has to others to hear what i have to offer so that they can be you know, they can decide if they're going to use it or yeah. not yeah yeah that's good um well so the last one is the converging path so this is when in a lot of people again don't know about this one they don't know about the blind spot path and they don't know about the converging path because they think oh you only go to type six when you're under stress and it's negative that's actually not true you use both the healthy all the way to the unhealthy of three and six and so when you've stepped out and you've grown in your nine you've grown in your kind of this three space like by you know knowing what you want and going after it in a very healthy way, you can also access now the healthiest part of the six. And this is where you're gonna become more hardworking, you're gonna be responsible and you're gonna have great follow through. You're gonna boldly assert yourself and your abilities on the benefit of others. And then you're gonna demonstrate courage by stepping out of your comfort zone into unfamiliar areas and pushing through adversity and difficulties. So as we were talking earlier, the type nine, when we hit roadblocks, difficulties, overwhelm, the first thing that comes to our mind is I'm out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I'm out. And that yep. could be numbing out, shutting down, quitting, like whatever. Like that's just kind of, I just want comfort. Um, yep. But the six offers us so much more perseverance, the ability to do hard work, to do hard things, and to do it courageously. Sixes are actually the most courageous on the Enneagram because they're constantly dealing with the anxiety and the what ifs of life, but they press through. So when okay. you feel at that spot of overwhelm, shut down, or I just wanna quit, tap into the six, let it assist you, and let it help you to persevere, to be, um, responsible, to be hardworking, to be diligent and faithful in all that you do. And for the nine to go, wow, that's a part of me. Like I can access that when I need, kind of like if salt and pepper were sitting, you know, and you're cooking, you can access that really easily yeah. to bring out and draw out the best flavor of like, let's say a steak. So you can use the six and the three in the okay. best ways possible to assist your nine, but you're still going to be a nine, the core motivations of a nine. Um, but that's how we want to use these two numbers. But if you over season it, like we are showing here on the the less healthy ways, and that's just, you know, it just doesn't work as well, right? Like it, it doesn't bring out the best of what you have to offer yeah. as a nine. So that's why I wanted to show you these um, Enneagram paths and how you use them both in healthy and unhealthy ways, because one, it starts to go, 
oh, I need to set up those rumble strips. I need to be aware of when these things are happening so I can nurture and care for myself. Because when you do, it benefits everyone around you, including yourself. Yeah. But then how can you bring in these healthy aspects? Because that's totally going to help and benefit you and others as well. So does this been helpful? Super helpful. Yes, this is great. Thank you. Good. Well, so this is kind of how I do a typing session is one, I just make sure that we're honing in on those core motivations. We're kind of looking at different types. We're peeling apart um, some of the surface stereotypical ways of seeing, you know, types and really getting to that core. And so by you being really honest and, you know, saying, yeah, I can see myself in seven, but, but not really the same way as I'm seeing nine. And then we did that with the six. It helps us to really narrow down that main type and why you do what you do. So thank you so much for just being transparent and honest and like just showing up today. I know that again, a lot of people are doing the Enneagram. It's like, what is this thing? But I hope that you can now see, wow, I have a lot of value as a nine. I bring peace to the world. I bring harmony. I see everyone's perspective. So I'm very empathetic. I'm compassionate. I have so much to offer the world. So I, I must change the trajectory of hoarding my gifts and abilities by not being confident and being confident and giving away all that I have, not in an arrogant way, but in a confident way that blesses others. Yeah. So I hope this is uh, really kind of just spurred your interest in diving in a little bit deeper so that you really can offer the world the best of who you are. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is this is fantastic. The deeper dive to see how all the the different aspects of each number connect and um that that's been super helpful cuz like you said, I I think I probably had a um very surface level almost uh, stereotypical yeah. um understanding of each number like I could probably somebody's probably summed up each number and like you know, a sentence to me before. And, and, and then you you kind of like make your own assumptions based on that. And that's not really a great way to, to um, right. really dive into this. So um, seeing how these all connect and how um, I can, you know, act like certain ones in certain situations um, has been super helpful. And I have a much awesome. a greater respect for uh, how all this uh, works and uh, how I can relate to other people around me. Um, Cause you know, yeah. no, knowing their numbers and how, it's way more complicated than just just the one number. Um, I can yeah. understand other people better. So yeah, and like you know, as you work with Jeff McCola, you know, as a yeah. six, you know, and the dynamics there. But then your wife is a two. Like, yeah. there's so much more that we can honor one another, but also honor ourselves and saying, hey, this is actually how I function best, or this actually really can spin me out. You know, it'd be really helpful if we come at it from this angle. And so just that clarity, you know, clarity is kind, right? So mm -hmm. for us to, and us nines, we don't know ourselves very well. We have very little clarity. It takes a lot of time and effort to get to know ourselves and then to name it and assert ourselves. Um, but when we do, it really allows those relationships to deepen and to blossom uh, way more than they could have if we just kind of stayed stagnant. So yeah, I'm really excited to kind of hear over because, you know, being connected with Jeff McCullough, um, hearing yep. how you're doing and, and how you're growing in this is going to be great. So yeah. thank you for showing up today. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope that you really enjoyed seeing kind of what a typing interview process with a certified Enneagram coach can look like. You know, a lot of people out there, they just take the assessment and they think, oh, that's it. That's my type. And that's not necessarily always true, as you saw today. So we hope that you guys that feel lost or feel confused will hire a certified Enneagram coach. You can go to myenneagramcoach.com, where we have lots of wonderful certified coaches that have gone through our certification program. They're ready to help and assist you with a typing session. And so we're also doing this uh, series because we want those that are interested in becoming Enneagram coaches to see what it's like to walk someone through um, whether a coaching session or a typing session. And it's so fun to have people right before us have these aha moments, the clarity, the insight. And I know so many of you are interested in that. So we're opening our registration of Become an Enneagram Coach certification on June 21st. And we can't wait for you guys to dive in and to join us there. If you have more questions, go ahead and email us at info at your You can also go to your 
forward slash BEC to learn more about our certification program. Now, I hope that you've joined us through our YouTube channel. If so, make sure that you like this video and hit that subscribe button. If you didn't, I hope that you'll go over there and check it out. It's so fun seeing the actual guest right there with us. And then you can also look at the document that we went through today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And remember, the Enneagram reveals our need for Jesus, not our need to work harder. It's the gospel that transforms us. Thanks guys for coming today.